Bible talk, question mark. Uh, you'll see why in just a minute. If you have your Bible with you, turn to Proverbs 26, and we're looking at verses 4 through 5. Old Covenant tonight, the uh, wisest man apart from the Lord Jesus that ever lived and walked on planet Earth, King Solomon, son of David, chapter 26 of his collection of wise sayings. We're looking at verses 4 and 5 of Proverbs 26, hopefully asking, or I should say answering the question, divine double talk? Hope not. It's a beautiful portion of scripture. I'm sure we've all heard it and we'll be looking at it now tonight in some detail. Just wanted to mention something I mentioned during our prayer time and just before about the school that we started a little over 20 years ago. And I, I found this very interesting. Barb looked me up the other day just out of curiosity online to see what would come up. And the usual things did, the school, the church, and, and the ministry, the overseas stuff and all that. But then she found a lot of other places that are, um, I don't know whether they're actually publishing houses, but they handle books. And they've got my books available, uh, PDFs, ours are free, and they've got them available, a number of my books, different places that I've never heard of. So, so where these people are getting them, maybe from our website and then adding it to their website. Um, so it reminds me of something the Lord told me. Maybe this will Lord, uh, apply it to you when you have prophetic words come too, just like anybody. But he told me something a couple of years ago now. It's going through kind of a tough time. And I was praying and he said, uh, if, you, if you knew what's actually going on overseas, you would never be discouraged another day in your life. I thought that was profound. And I, of course, I didn't know what he's talking about. But this is, gives me an idea how many more things like this are happening that we're not paying for, we're not soliciting and it's just being distributed, and who knows? We've had people write us and actually send us pages that they've translated into Tamil and some other Indian dialects and whatnot. So I guess that's really true. Yeah, and the reason I mention it is this is not a one-man operation. If we weren't all working together, we couldn't be doing these things. So we're all going to share in the reward. How many believe that? Yeah. This, I mean, are we a local church? Yes. Am I a pastor? Yes, but I'm not only a pastor. And, and Paul's, uh, Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to one of his servants, you won't lose your reward. You know? So if you partner with a prophet or partner with an apostolic ministry or whatever, you share in that reward. It's as though you're part of it. So I think it's kind of, kind of exciting. So I, I thought that was really special. I've never heard of these different companies that she found. I, I just came up, my name came up, and there were my books. So who knows? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, you just don't, you don't know. It just multiplies. Yeah, it, it's really quite something. We better get into the word now. Hopefully answering the question, divine double talk. It seems like it. We will see. Uh, it says in chapter 26, verse 4 of uh, the book of Proverbs, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. That's King James. We'll be looking at some others. It's been quite a while since I mentioned this, but years and years ago, I read a story about a minister. I believe it was in the UK someplace. And uh, this minister had been bad-mouthed by a lady that wasn't even a member of his congregation. And she was just telling tales about him all over town. And uh, finally, he found out about it. She found out that he found out about it. So she was really chagrined and, of course, really felt bad because she was, you know, caught out at it. And she felt so bad that she actually had a private appointment with him to apologize. And she said, I know that you know what I've been saying about you behind your back. And I just, you know, I just feel so bad about it now. And I, I'm just asking you, Reverend, would you please forgive me? He said, well, first of all, he said, there's nothing to forgive because you didn't break my law that says you're not supposed to slander people. That was God's law. And God's already forgiven everybody in Christ. You just have to receive that. Oh, I've never heard anything like that. So he preached a little bit about the gospel. 
And he said, but I, I, I do want to tell you something else about what happened. She said, sure. So he went over and he grabbed a pillow. He opened his window. He was up pretty high. Opened his window and cut the pillow, and it was full of feathers. And he shook it. And the feathers were t picked up by the wind, and they went everywhere. She said, what are you doing? He said, well, I just want to let you know that actions have consequences. And I can't do anything about that. Neither can God. Your words are like those feathers. They have gone everywhere, and they can't be brought back. Words are powerful. They can either build up or they can tear down. In my little book, A Horse of a Different Color, I have the, the uh, champion's owner talking to him about that very thing, the power, the power of words. They can be positive, they can be negative, and they have an effect. So two things tonight, two things about this portion of Scripture. The first, something that you and I should stop. The second thing in these two verses, something that you and I are encouraged to start. Really simple, but this is to me very profound information, so I hope we can take it to heart. Stop. What is it that you and I as believers should cease? What should we stop doing? Here it is. Do not answer a fool according to his foolishness so that you, you also will not be like him. Other versions read like this. Answer him in his own foolish terms. If you answer a silly question, you are just as silly as the person who asked it. I like this one. Leave the fool's challenge unanswered. Now, we need to say right from the get-go, when we talk about this concept of the fool, we're talking about the Bible use of this word. And the Bible does not use the word fool to describe somebody that's mentally challenged or has some other kind of physical deficiency that affects the way they think or speak or hear, uh, etc. It refers rather to the wickedness of a person's nature, uh, moral repugnance toward God. And I, I found this interesting. I looked this word up, <clears throat> the root of this word, in the 70, in the Greek version, what we would call the people's Bible of uh, the early church and the Lord Jesus. They quoted from it and taught from it. And the, 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 the root of this word fool is aphron, aphron, which means friend is mind, thinking, ability. And if you put an A in front of it, alpha in front of it, it means it, it negates it. I've mentioned like we talk about an atheist, theos is God. You put alpha in front of that, an atheist, no God. So this is what it, how it was described in the lexicon. Crazy, this word, aphron, fool. Crazy, foolish, not just that, sinful, ungodly. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Rebellious toward God. So when you read fool all over the book of Proverbs or elsewhere in the Old Covenant, that's what we're talking about. And as I've already mentioned, the 70 here, again, is helpful for another reason. I've mentioned this a time or two, but if someone new listening or watching, you know, why are you talking about the Greek Old Testament? Well, because that was the Bible of the days of Jesus and the early church. They had been reading from this version for about 200 years before Christ came. Uh, very, very rare for a Jewish person to read uh, or speak biblical Hebrew. It was a dead language to the average person. People that studied, people that were in, in charge of the ministry, they would know it, but the average Jewish person wouldn't. They would know their vernacular, Aramaic, but there, aren't, there were no and there are no Aramaic Old Testaments. So all they had was the Greek version because most Jews were bilingual in the time of Christ. So that's why we look at this version quite a bit because it's the one that they were using. As, as uh, the text reads, it appears to be a warning to the unwary. Listen to the Greek version. It's kind of saying this. Be prepared. Don't be caught off guard. What I just read you from the Old Testament Hebrew text. Be prepared. You know, don't be caught off guard by a fool. When a fool comes your way, be ready to blah, 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 blah. But the 70 is very interesting here. When you read it, it reads a little differently. And think about this. You've got Jewish translators taking the Hebrew text 
and putting it into the Greek language. These are Jewish people, not Greek people. Jewish people bringing Hebrew into Greek, and yet it reads differently than it does in the Hebrew text. Why would that happen? I can't answer that for you. I've said it before. I wonder if God did not perhaps, at least on occasion, inspire these translators as they brought Hebrew into Greek because many, many times, in many, many passages, the two versions are quite different. And I guess you probably know, as I do, two-thirds of the body of Christ actually believes that the Greek Old Testament is inspired. The Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, both those denominations believe it's God's word, just like the Hebrew original. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying whether it is or isn't. I'm just saying it won't hurt to look at it. Here's how the Greek version reads. Me, Apokrino, stop answering a fool according to his folly. How many see the difference? As it reads in the text, don't do this. In other words, you're doing pretty good, and don't mess it up by letting a fool make a fool of you. Don't take the vocal bait, right? And that's true. That's great and good advice. But the Greek version goes even farther. In other words, it says this. You've got to change your lifestyle. They're basically saying King Solomon is suggesting most of you that read this have already been hooked by the bait of, of an idiot, right? And so stop letting it happen. Um, I remember years ago, I was in a situation when I was in high school and went to the prom. And, and long story short, I let my girlfriend's friends use the car that we were using for some reason or other. And they wound up filling it with beer. We had no idea. So went to get the car. Cops found out there was beer in the back. You know. I thought, Holy smoke. She, she looks at me. I look, look at her. And fortunately, her dad was a pretty influential guy. So he showed up. He sorted it all out. He knew the cops and all that. And, and he said, you know, this guy wouldn't do anything like that. Neither would my daughter. Don't let her do that. And they understood. And it was all over and done. And I, I just wanted to crawl in a hole and die, you know. But he, a nice fella, he came over to me and said, Joe, don't worry about it. He said, the only thing worse than a bad experience is not learning anything from it. I thought, I'm off, I'm off the hook. And, and that's what this is saying. Sure, you've been caught. You've been tricked by a fool. But you don't have to stay there. You can turn this thing around. I like that. Stop answering a fool according to his foolishness. So if we're already in the habit of getting involved, and most of us are, how do we change our lifestyle and from what to what? I think it's really simple. It comes down to moving from reacting, he, she says something stupid, and then we, boom, come right back with it, something that is stupid or worse. It's moving from reacting. Why? That puts them in charge. That puts the fool in charge of your life. Think about that. They've got you at the disadvantage. So it's changing from reacting, where he's in charge or she's in charge, to responding. What's the difference? If I respond, if you respond, we are in charge under God, not the fool. And it's really simple to do sometimes. Sometimes it's just, just as simple as counting to two before you answer. Somebody says something stupid, something silly, or something to deliberately get you into an argument, and you just, just don't, don't respond right away. Take a, take a beat or two. Count maybe to three. Inwardly, they don't know what you're doing. Uh, I, I was talking to somebody just the other day, and I, and I had enough sense not to respond, but after the fact, I thought if I'd have waited a little longer, I know what I could have and should have said. It wouldn't have changed anything for me, but it would have helped that other person if I would have just waited a little longer and told them what I felt came to my mind at that point. Hope we're all together on this thing. So the last version kind of fits in here. Leave the fool's challenge unanswered. I've said this before. I don't know where I heard it, but I think it's great. You and I will never be misquoted regarding something we didn't say. If silence is golden speech, uh, you know, it, it is a jewel, right? But not necessarily. Sometimes silence trumps the, uh, the speech. 
So here's the 70s version. Watch this. Stop answering a fool according to the foolishness, and I found this interesting, of Ekino. That one. It's like, wow. It doesn't say just him or his foolishness or he. It says that one. It's a demonstrative pronoun. It's just like that person has just been circled by the finger of God and highlighted by the Holy Spirit, and he's glowing in the dark. In other words, don't be like that guy. That guy is trouble. That guy is rebellious toward God. He's sinful. He's ungodly. He's crazy. He's foolish. He's an idiot. And, uh, you know, you stay around him, you're going to pick up his, his habits. Stop answering a fool according to the foolishness of that one. Why is that, Solomon? In order that you become not as him. Wow. Do you see why we look at the Greek version sometimes? The people's Bible of the New Testament days? Because of things like this. That you become not as him. I looked at that and the word is a word that's used among other things for birth. In other words, you could actually, you could actually birth an evil habit by continuing to fellowship with idiots. It, it rubs off on you. It affects the way you think, the way you speak, how you spend your money, how you spend your time, what church you go to, where you do your shopping, what job you have, etc., etc., what kind of car you drive. You can become like that idiot. You can birth a habit that will bring you nothing but trouble. This is kind of where we live, isn't it? This is, I mean, they're out there. They're everywhere. Have you noticed, or is it just me? <laughs> Nobody in their right mind does what people are doing today. They're everywhere. One, one world-class preacher said one big reason he doesn't want to go to hell is because he'd be with idiots for eternity. He's, he said, I want to go to heaven to be with Jesus, but I'm really glad I'm going to miss hell so I don't have to spend eternity with this lot, you know? And some people say there's no hell. I mean, how about that? Oh, we're all going to heaven, you know? Or I've, had, I've had people ask me, why? Oh, why would God create a hell? And I want to say, so I don't have to spend eternity with people like you. That's why. I mean, we've got, an, we've got enough sense to put idiots behind bars, don't we? Don't you think God's as smart as we are? He's going to let that kind of riffraff and, and idiocy and rebellion and people that hate him and hate his people spend eternity in heaven? That would make heaven hell, wouldn't it? To be surrounded by idiots the rest of your eternity? It's terrible. Now think about this. Think about that. I'm not making this up. In the book of Haggai, the prophet, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, we get a picture of this. And basically what we have here is evil, foolishness, rebellion is catching, but holiness isn't. Holiness is not catching. You don't catch the gospel. You have to think it through. You have to intentionally surrender your heart and will to the lordship of Jesus. I use the example of a little chair. I like that because it's a, that's what the four spiritual laws use. I'm kind of partial to that little tract because that's how I got saved. We come into this world, we're sitting on that throne and Jesus is out here someplace if he's around at all. Once in a while if we're in trouble, hey, can you help me out? That's not salvation. You believe in Jesus? Oh, of course I do. You really believe? Yeah, just like I believe George Washington's the first president. I really believe it. Changing your life? No. Your belief in Christ? Changing your life? No. Why? I'm still sitting on the throne. He's out here someplace. That's not salvation. Salvation is you get off the throne. You're out here and Jesus is there. You can't catch holiness, but you can catch evil. In Haggai, Yahweh through the prophet says, ask the priest, if you're carrying holy stuff in your garment, whether it's you know, wine or, or bread or whatever, holy stuff, stuff that's been set apart for the Lord for holiness, and you touch something 
unclean, does it become holy? The priest said, no. What if you're carrying, what if you're carrying something and, and you're next to a corpse or something? Will that corpse be, will your, will your holiness abide? No, you become defiled, right? The priest could be carrying holy stuff, but he, if he's in those days, but if he's by a corpse, he's no longer clean. He can't serve in the ministry. So holiness cannot be caught, but evil can. Touching something, if you're clean, you touch something unclean, it doesn't become clean in Bible language. How many are with me? So there's some things to stop. Let's look at some things to start. I got 15 minutes, I think, so on, unless I started late. Anyway, they're, they're prisoners here, and there's no way out. What do we start doing? We start tailoring our talking. Uh, here's the other vote, the other verse. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, is it? 25? 26? 26, yeah. Verse 5, second, the second of our two verses. On the surface, and we just read it a little while ago, it seems like double talk, doesn't it? It seems like double speak. Which is it, Lord? You're kind of basically saying the same thing twice, but yet they seem to, that they seem to disagree with each other. So here's how it reads. Give a foolish man a foolish answer. I like this one. Prick his conceit with silly replies. I like this one too. Answer a fool as his folly deserves. For what purpose? So that he will not be being wise in his own eyes. Another version has it, lest he imagine he's wise. In other words, he's not, but he thinks he is. Once again, let's look at the 70. But in contrast to answering a fool, in the same way he's talking to you, going down to his level. But in contrast to that, answer a fool according to his foolishness in order that he may not appear wise in his own eyes. In order that he may stop appearing wise in his own eyes. You look at that carefully with me tonight. There's a subtle suggestion of the possibility of a change in spiritual direction, even from a hardened fool, even from someone who's practiced being sinful, rebellious toward God and foolish in his lifestyle or her lifestyle. But that change in their direction will only happen if we handle them the right way. If we react, knee-jerk reaction to their silly question or stupid comment, we're worse off and haven't helped them. But if we stop, look, listen first, not only do we not get caught, but we might be able to help them. I want to give us three examples here of, of uh, this happening in the New Testament. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them. I won't answer them, but you can ask them. Um, again, start by refusing to stoop to the level of that idiot who's trying to hook you or me with his vocal bait. Jesus did this with Pilate. Did you know that? I found this verse very interesting. In Mark's account of the passion of Christ, right before he's sentenced, in Mark 15, 4, Pilate has been telling Jesus about all the charges that the Jewish elite are leveling against him. And then all the power that, that he has to either acquit or accuse Jesus. And in Mark's account, in chapter 15, verse 4, the scripture says, Jesus answered no longer, not even one thing. Remember what the one version said about the previous verse? Leave the fool's challenge unanswered. That's what Jesus did, according to Mark's account. According to Mark's account, he stopped speaking. He, he spoke not even one thing. What happened to Pilate? Read it. He marveled. Wow. 
He marveled. Wow, he's not even trying to defend himself. Who is this guy? I thought for sure he'd drop to his knees and kiss my feet or try to kiss my hand or start begging for his freedom. He's completely, I feel like I'm on trial here. The master didn't take the bait. Watch, he did it a second time. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 23 through 27, you have the picture there, same time frame. He's getting close to the time of his passion, death, and resurrection. And everybody and their brother is accusing him of things. And <clears throat> the Jewish authorities of the day yet again questioned him regarding his authority. And I mean, we have to, in a sense, sit where they sat, give them every benefit of the doubt. Okay, here's an uneducated woodworker by trade, right? He's not from Jerusalem. We know he was born in Bethlehem. He spent some time in Jerusalem, not a lot. But he wasn't from there. He was from up north in Nazareth, which was heavily pagan, uh, 45 minutes or so from Sepharis, which was a major Greek city. He was not formally trained. You'll see several times, where did this man get this since he doesn't know letters, which means he was not formally trained, which means, as I understand the scripture, just like the apostles were accused, he didn't speak or read Hebrew. So he was disqualified. So in one sense, you can see why the Jews would, hey, this guy doesn't even, he's not even been to school. He's not even been, uh, you know, ordained by the right people. He doesn't even know the text. He's reading that people's Bible, you know, the, the Greek version. He doesn't know it. And so give him the benefit of the doubt, but still, do you agree with me that he had said on more than one occasion what authority he had? I only say, I only do what I see my father doing. I and my father are one essence, not one person, one essence. He said it repeatedly. So what were they doing? They were being rebellious. They were fools. They were idiots. They knew where he thought his authority came from in their minds. It did, but they thought he thought that. They knew that, but they were trying to trip him up yet again. He stated it repeatedly. How did, he, how did he deal with this? He did not react to what they said. He paused, and then he responded. He said, all right, I'll answer that question. But first, I've got a question for you. The baptism of my second cousin, John, was it from God or was it from man? <laughs> Can you imagine them? Oops, talk about an oops minute. What do, we, what, do we, what do we do now? If we say it came from God, he's going to ask us, well, why didn't we get baptized and why didn't we follow him? If we say it didn't come from God, look at all these people that follow John that think he's a prophet. Uh, 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 we don't know. What did Jesus say? Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, what if you've already been caught? What if I've already been caught? What if I've been tripped up by an idiot? And I've been, I've, it's a knee-jerk reaction. I've got into a back and forth with them, that, which is exactly what they want. You know, where did Cain get his wife? Remember what Billy Graham said about that? Who cares, as long as he was satisfied? Um, <clears throat> wow. Or, yeah, well, you know, is there really a hell? You know, why would God create hell again? So we wouldn't have to spend eternity with people like you. Um, I hate to be that way, but let's be honest about it. We know what we were like before we were saved. Why would anybody else be different to us, right? I wouldn't want to be with me for eternity before I got saved. Those, that lot would make heaven hell. I know it's strong language, but, you know, wow. I was going to mention it Sunday. I probably will do because we're talking about hundreds, husbands and wives on Sunday. Some of our dear women folk... I could, I could save them a lot of money at the hairdressers. I'd give them a permanent without any treatment at all just by telling them some stories, counseling stories over nearly 50 years of ministry. They'd, get, they'd have a permanent instantly. You'd be surprised how many idiots have ruined, women have ruined families, and uh, there's no cure for it apart from the grace of God. One more time. What happens now, this third possibility, what happens when 
you know, we've made a mistake, we've got caught, is there a way out? Yes, our last example is Paul. You should read this sometime. Acts 23, verses 1 through 6, real quickly. He's been brought up on charges, and Ananias, who was the high priest at the time, although Paul didn't know it, um, orders him. All, all Paul said, read it, all Paul said was, I've lived in good conscience, you know, before God and man all these years. And Ananias said, let him have it. Boom. Can you imagine? Probably Paul got a nosebleed or a bleeding lip. They smacked him hard across the face. And what did Paul do? I got to tell you, from what I read, he did not respond. He did not count to two and then decide what to say. He just, boom, he reacted. He said, God's going to smite you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> and all the friends of Ananias that were there said, how dare you speak this way to the high priest? And what did Paul say? Ebda, 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 that's all, folks. No. And it's not in jest, in my opinion. You can study it out if you want. It's not, I don't think it was in jest at all. He said, I didn't know he was the high priest, for you should not speak evil of the uh, people that are in charge of your people, right? And uh, some people have wondered, what's that all about? You know, well, you have to think it through. Paul uh, didn't spend a lot of time in Jerusalem, and he probably, it's very likely, he had never seen Ananias one-on-one. -on -one. Or if he did, it would have been just a passing thing, wouldn't have recognized him. And we have no proof here that Ananias was in a special seat of the high priest. He was just apparently just sitting with the rest of the Jewish elite when this happened. But Paul still did the wrong thing. He lost his temper. He reacted. That put them in charge rather than responding. What would have put him in charge under God, right? So he, aren't you glad that he sat where we sit, just like Jesus? He made the same kind of mistakes that we make, maybe more, maybe less. But think about this. After he was told this, he said, I'm sorry. I did not know and then quoted the scripture. At first, he objected. He prophesied that man's doom. But then what did he do? He apologized. Would you like a little footnote? God will smite you, you whitewashed wall. Within a year, within a year, he was deposed from being high priest. Not only that, but in A.D. 66, not long after this conversation took place, he was killed by Jewish zealots that thought he was too pro-Roman. So Ananias, the high priest that had Paul slapped unnecessarily, was himself deposed from the position within a year or so and then killed by his own people for being pro-Roman. Talk about the kettle calling the pot black, as they say, right? Both the same situation. So I think this is really interesting. Even when you and I wind up in a problem with a fool, that's not the end of the story. We can still sometimes salvage it to where we keep ourselves from a problem and also possibly help them uh, like Pilate may have been helped. Remember when he washed his hands? You could see something happening there, and you can read about that. There are some early traditions that say that Pilate eventually got saved. Maybe he did. I don't know. Last time I, I was around Pilate was when I was in Switzerland, and my mom and I, had, we had a free afternoon, and we went up in a little buggy all the way up to the top of Mount Pilatus after Pilate. That's the only Pilate. That's the closest I got to Pilate, 7,000 miles in the air. And that was really something because... Um, we came back down from there in a different kind of contraption. It was just a little swinging thing. 7,000 feet. And I don't like heights. There I was with my mom going down. I, I talked to the person, was a handful of us in the same little basket. I said, how long does this thing take? About 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, I, about sw I about swallowed my tongue, you know. <laughs> I, th I said, come on now, really. How long does this trip take? 30 minutes. <laughs> I said, wow. <laughs> So I probably aged a little bit till I got down, but that was the end of Pilatus for me. In any case, how, how, how does this happen? One more verse you can just take with you. It's Mark 13, 11. This is what happened to the master himself, twice that we mentioned tonight, and also once to, to Paul that we've mentioned. And that is Mark 13, 11. Jesus says, when you're under the gun, 
in that case, it's you know being persecuted or whatever, people coming against you. But it, it applies to any kind of negative back and forth with people, including fools, idiots. Um, <clears throat> don't, don't premeditate what you're going to say, for it will be given to you right in that moment. It'll be given to you right then what you should say. And I really think that's what happened in the case of Jesus and Paul. And I really believe it's, it's going to happen for you and for me. Uh, this is how it's going to work out for us. Um, if we're willing to think this thing through and to say, you know what? I'm, I'm worth enough to not allow myself to be taken advantage of or deceived. I, I'm, I'm, worth being, I'm worth taking care of myself. Number two, you know what? There's always the dawn of a new day for the person that's looking for it. And who knows? I might be able to make lemonade out of lemons. I may be able to bring salvation out of an awkward conversation. You never know if I'm willing to do my part, which I think the Lord has laid out for us today. So divine double talk, the answer there, of course, is no. Uh, the Lord's saying two different things through uh, King Solomon, and they're both true. And the good news is we get to decide what we're going to do about the information. And I, I think it's real helpful. I don't know what it is with me, but the last five, six years, this kind of thing's been more and more important to me, how I relate to other people in terms of conversation, how I, how I react to bad situations, how I treat people that <clears throat> I know are, are working against me. They don't think I know, but I do. How do I handle those kinds of situations? Um, and I think this is where it can, it can be really helpful. Any questions on this, Ricky? On the subject that I had told the Lord, I said, when someone is doing evil to me, and I said, and I said it in this word, I said, I don't care what it is. Don't let me do evil to them, because you don't do evil for evil because you don't read it. Right? But I told the Lord, I said, I'm going to do good now. I said, keep my enemies close and my friends close. Amen. Yes. But I told God, Amen. I'm going to keep close and far off. Uh, doing loving kindness all over again. Yeah. And I ask every day, God, yeah. fill me with your love. Yeah. Let it overflow and let it draw somebody to you. Yeah. I've been acting. That's, that's a good way to live. And it's tripping me out. Well, you'll feel better too. I, I look. Right. It, it brought me in here on time. <laughs> yeah, you'll feel better too. Anybody else? This is kind of where we live, isn't it? Uh, especially with your traveling. Yeah. You know, half my life. I've been like an idiot, you know? I mean, really, you too? I, mean, I had some good things, but I just was just in another dimension or something, yep. you know? Yep. And, uh, and I got saved, and that helped, but then you've got all that stuff you got to clean up, and you can't really do it on your own, you know? Right. You can't really make yourself good. No. You know, and so part of it for me, is the things that I've done that were not right were God used to make right because of the bad things I did. Wow. He, all, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And so I was sitting here the other day thinking, you know, here I am this age, and it's taken me like 50 years just to get to where I was halfway sane. You know? Yes, I do. I mean, I'm a recovering alcoholic, drug addict. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, everything I did was uh, based on selfishness and self-centeredness, you yeah, know? Right. And, uh, but then, by the grace of God, I got so whipped that I finally surrendered. Yeah. And there's different levels of surrender. Yeah. But when you really do that, and you know that God's really the one in control, it changes your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. And you start feeling the presence of God and things happen. Yeah. But it's not because I can't stand before God and say, look what I did, you know, because I didn't do it. <laughs> if God doesn't do it, it ain't going to happen. Right. right. Yeah. He does his part. He does his part. But we have to cooperate. So you can be pretty bad yep. and wind up being good. Yeah. But not because of what you did, because of his mercy That's and right. grace. Yep. Yep. And then when you realize it's mercy and grace, it changes your whole outlook on life. It's it's a humbling thing and I
You mentioned it's taken you a long while to get where you are. Um, I, think, I think every believer can relate to that. I've mentioned that, I may have mentioned this before, but it's really coming home to me. Maybe I'm going to be doing some traveling. I don't know. But um, it, I had to wait six years to go to the mission field, and I had that strong call on me. And, and I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Lately, when I look back to my missionary work there, I, I'm thinking, I wish I could have gone now. I didn't know enough. Back then, I didn't want to wait. You know, I, Six years was like 60 years. And now, looking back, I feel like I've actually finally learned something. But again, God knows, right? So apparently, whatever I knew at that point was enough to help people there then. But I know what you're talking about. I think we can all relate to that. You, you feel like... <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far, but it's like I finally, I finally learned something. You know, I finally get something, and I, it's too late because I've already been there, you know? But, yeah, well, where'd that happen? How'd that happen? <laughs> Was that wrong? I didn't. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, we're going to come around the Lord's table. If you're given tonight, we got baskets here, one in the hallway. No, you're good. You're good. It, it is. You're good. I get, there's one little copy of my book. Um, if you're looking for Christmas presents, because I get about a buck per book if, this, if Amazon sells it. But no, but I think I've gotten good reports from that little book out there, A Horse of a Different Color. So uh, it's available. Not, I might get some more here, but it's, it, you can get it through Amazon, either a paperback or a Kindle. Seems, people seem to like it. It's helping them. We're going to come around the Lord's table now.